These tiny mosquitoes are the deadliest creatures on Earth. They transmit malaria. The viral infection kills 400,000 people each year. Around two-thirds of them are children under five. An end could be in sight, though, thanks to coronavirus research. Experts are working on a vaccine to stop malaria using the same breakthrough mRNA technology that proved so successful in coronavirus vaccines. Welcome to your COVID-19 special here on DW. I'm Chris Kolber in Berlin. More than 200 million people infect themselves with malaria each year, according to the World Health Organization. And as we've seen, around 400,000 of them die. Doctors have long hoped for an effective vaccine. Now that may be a step closer, in part due to the effort to combat COVID-19. Much of the world is engaged in a struggle against malaria, like here in Singapore. Often insecticides are the only defense against the female Anopheles mosquito. A single bite from an infected insect is all it takes for the parasites called plasmodia to enter the bloodstream and infect humans with the disease. Germany's BioNTech wants to try a different approach, one using knowledge gained from the pandemic. Our goal is to develop a vaccine which makes the malaria parasite visible and attackable by the immune system from the very beginning when it is most vulnerable. BioNTech caused a sensation last year when its COVID-19 vaccine was the first to be authorized by a stringent medical regulator. That also made it the first medical product ever approved to be based on mRNA technology. The M in mRNA stands for messenger, and it means that people are injected with a message containing details about parts of a virus. For the coronavirus, this is the spike protein. The message allows the body to start producing these proteins itself. The immune system then recognizes it's coming under attack and fights back. BioNTech says malaria is an obvious next step. Why now? Well, because the time is ripe. The response to the pandemic has shown that science and innovation can make a difference when stakeholders work together towards a common goal and with joint willpower. It also takes a lot of money. In 2020 alone, more than 14 billion euros flowed into the development of a COVID-19 vaccine worldwide. That's much more than has been available to malaria research. mRNA technology is helping us to save lives from COVID-19, a disease that we have only known about for 19 months. Malaria has been with us for millennia. Eradicating it has been a long-held but unattainable dream. BioNTech intends to set up production facilities where malaria is most deadly, in Africa. But first, clinical studies for the new vaccine must be carried out, and they could start as early as next year. Let's unpack this with Alex Danis. She is a geneticist and a science communicator. She joins me from LA. Welcome uh, to COVID-19 special here on DW, Alex. In 2019, more than 400,000 people so died of malaria, according to the World Health Organization, with children under five accounting for two-thirds of the fatalities. How hopeful are you that an RNA vaccine will help tackle this disease? I'm actually very hopeful. You know, there hasn't been a lot to be very hopeful about over the past year, but I think one of the great things that we've seen is huge improvements in RNA vaccine technology. This is something that many people have been working on for decades, and I'm very encouraged to see it now being applied towards other diseases beyond COVID-19 with all of the different things we've learned over the past year. Uh, let's stick uh, uh, to malaria here for a second. Experts say that developing a vaccine against malaria will be tricky because the parasite causing the disease is more complex than viruses. Do you agree? I do agree. So unlike a bacteria or a virus, which you have sort of one thing to tackle when you're infected with it. The malaria life cycle is a lot more complicated. There's a part of the life cycle that happens in humans and a part of the life cycle that happens in mosquitoes, which is why sort of you get that cyclical 
uh, sort of infection of humans to mosquitoes. And there are many different life stages of that parasite throughout. So it's not just one thing that we're trying to tackle. We really have to focus in on perhaps a specific life stage or a specific part of that uh, sort of cycle. So it is a much more complicated thing because it is a parasite rather than a bacteria or a virus. But there have been some sort of strides made towards malaria vaccines in the past that have been a little less effective, but have given us some ideas of good targets to go after. So it is, uh, in my opinion, much more complicated than a bacteria or a virus. But I think that RNA vaccines are going to be a great way to try and tackle it. Now, the road to success here could be provided uh, by the messenger RNA technology, which, ha which has been around uh, for some time. Now, for somebody that is not as involved as, in, in science as you are, why did it still take time to develop a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine if the technology had been there? You know, we really had been working sort of the scientific community on RNA vaccines for a couple of decades, but there were a few large challenges that we had to overcome in the past five years or so to actually take it from something that was a prospective technology to something that could actually work. There were a few key challenges around both stability and delivery of that RNA, which had been just about solved at the end of 2019, sort of 2018, 2019. And then it really took the concerted effort of so many people around the world coming together to tackle SARS-CoV-2, uh, both from a resource you know, of people and a resource of money and time perspective, to really push that technology over the finish line and get it to our first uh, sort of really working RNA vaccines. So in broad words, what are the advantages here of the mRNA technology compared to others? There are a number of advantages of RNA vaccines to other types of vaccines. And one, of course, is sort of the fact that you don't actually need to work with the pathogen itself to create these vaccines. So all you really need to have is a Word document or a file with just the genetic sequence of what you're trying to target. And from there, you can already immediately start to uh, create these vaccines. So they're very adaptable. You don't need to have the pathogen and work with the pathogen to do this. One of the other benefits because of that is that the vaccine itself, unlike perhaps an attenuated vaccine or a weakened or dead vaccine, again, you're not delivering that virus or that pathogen to people. You're only working with a very small piece of it, one small part of that larger pathogen puzzle. So there isn't this chance of sort of reinfection or the ability to actually get that disease from the vaccine because you're only working with one small part of it not all of it. So they're very adaptable. They're pretty fast to get off the ground, which is great if you have some sort of pandemic situation. And they're, uh, they have a much more uh, sort of broad safety profile because of a couple of those things. Now, malaria has gotten into focus, as has cancer, as a possible disease that could be addressed with this technology. Uh, this all seems highly ambitious and basically from one day to the next. Uh, can and will mRNA be the platform to fighting many other pathogens? So if I had a crystal ball to tell you that, you know, I would certainly be uh, in a great position. But so while I can't say that for certain, I'm very, very encouraged by the work we've seen on RNA vaccines over the past year. I really think now that we have this technology figured out, we can begin to apply it to everything from other pathogens to cancer. Anything where we have a genetic sequence that we can try and target and we can try and prime your own immune system to fight and recognize, I think RNA vaccines are going to be a really, really interesting platform moving forward. And I do think they have a lot of promise to try and tackle many of these things. Alex Danis, geneticist and science communicator. Alex, thank you for your thoughts. Thank you so much. So mRNA vaccines could help fight malaria, but how do they fight the coronavirus? Our science correspondent Derek Williams has the answer. How does the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine work? I've answered this before, but the question is posted again and again. So I guess it's maybe time to go over the details again. Um, two of the vaccines that have now been widely approved, uh, one developed by BioNTech and Pfizer and one produced by Moderna, are what are called uh, messenger RNA or mRNA vaccines. Now, the technology behind them has been at the focus of a lot of research for decades, but but this is the first time they've received widespread approval from healthcare authorities. Um, unlike 
vaccines based on traditional platforms, uh, ones that, for example, use inactivated versions of the virus. Uh, the BioNTech-Pfizer vaccine leads to an immune response in the body by delivering information in the form of a special molecule, a messenger RNA. mRNA molecules are, are single-stranded chains of what are called nucleotides that fulfill a, a very important function in cells. They're, they're kind of the blueprints for making proteins and act as messengers between a cell's headquarters in the nucleus and its protein-building factories out in the cytoplasm, hence, hence the name. Uh, but the protein these new mRNA vaccines encode for isn't a human one. It's a protein made by the coronavirus. And when that mRNA is injected, it causes your cells to begin making that viral protein. And that viral protein provokes an immune response, just as if you'd caught COVID-19. Sending in the pretty simple, quick-to-produce mRNA code molecules to make these complicated proteins and getting the body to do the work is a great solution to a complex problem. And, and there are high hopes that mRNA vaccines, uh, which, which seem to have finally come into their own, um, are now set to, to revolutionize a range of fields in medicine. Now here in Germany, the new school year has begun in some states, and with the return to classroom instruction, health officials and politicians are calling for children between the ages of 12 and 17 to get vaccinated against the coronavirus. It's a controversial appeal since the country's vaccine authority has only explicitly recommended the jab for members of the age group if they suffer from certain chronic illnesses. That's our show for now. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and see you back here tomorrow.